Thank you, Sabrina. She's going to lead um, an overview of the Utah Neoseq project. Sabrina Malone Jenkins is an assistant professor of pediatrics um, in the Division of Neonatology and is a PI of the Utah Neoseq project. She'll provide an introduction and then um, she'll also introduce our other panel presenters and we'll be able to have um, a good, uh, hopefully, chunk of time for discussion with them. So thank you, Sabrina. All right. We want to thank the Center for Genomic Medicine for the opportunity to do this work, and I feel honored to present at this symposium. I am privileged to work with the individuals that you will meet today. You will see a lot of faces during this presentation. I wanted to illustrate how many people it takes to make a project of this magnitude successful. I personally have no conflicts to disclose. However, I must disclose that the University of Utah has a financial interest in VAST, CAE, and Backdrop Health. And three of our investigators, Barry Moore, Mark Yandel, and Alexander Henry also have a financial interest in these technologies. To provide some background, in 2015, in collaboration with Steve Slyle and AREP Laboratories, we started offering RAPSEQ, which is a targeted gene panel with preliminary results available between six and 15 days. It was hugely successful in the NICU with benefits in both clinical utility and cost effectiveness. In 2019, at Primary Children's Hospital through the Center for Personalized Medicine, we started offering a clinical rapid whole genome sequencing. Dr. Marty Tristani then asked, why aren't we doing this at the University of Utah? We have the clinical diagnostic infrastructure of ARUP and the state-of-the-art computational tools developed by the Utah Center for Genetic Discovery. So with the help of many individuals, that's exactly what we did. To highlight some of these individuals, I have included their pictures here. The purpose of this study is to develop and evaluate a rapid whole genome sequencing test to provide a genetic diagnosis in critically ill infants in the NICU. What makes this study unique is creating a pipeline that allows for a rapid turnaround time of less than seven days for sequencing, analysis, and return of results. This study will enable us to learn about the benefits and the limitations for different health conditions, help us discover new genetic diseases, and improve the tools used to analyze genetic data. Bringing precision medicine to the NICU transforms neonatal care, leading to better diagnosis and treatment. As you can imagine, this requires the collaboration from a large group of individuals. Here is an overview of the process. Pediatric and maternal fetal medicine subspecialists are identifying patients and our genetic counselor is consenting the families. ARUP is doing the whole genome sequencing and UCGD is conducting the analysis. Potential results are reviewed by a board which consists of molecular geneticists, medical genetics, and other pediatric subspecialists. Then results are returned to parents and care providers. We are doing trio testing that consists of the infant or proband and both parents. We're targeting infants with multiple congenital anomalies, unexplained seizures, arthrogryposis, or non-immune hydrops fatalis. This is a phenotypic driven approach, so we're looking at variants related to the infant's medical condition. Unique to this study is that we are enrolling pre and postnatally. We're consenting at the fetal care center, draw cord blood at the time of delivery, and have a result back within the first week of life. This expedited timeline is what makes this testing so impactful. Parents are counseled before and after testing that these are research results and require confirmation testing. Our WGS test is done in parallel with normal standard of care management. Because this study is the first of its kind here at the university, we formed an expert panel of legal and ethical counsel, including members of the University of Utah IRB, genetic laboratory directors, and clinician researchers, with the goal of reviewing and evaluating applicable laws and weighing them with ethical considerations. It was determined that this is a non-significant risk study based on a previous FDA ruling that cited three points. One, the study population is critically ill and unlikely to be diagnosed quickly by standard of care testing. Two, the treating physician can apply clinical judgment on whether treatment is warranted, including the potential risk benefits that the patient may incur given the nature or severity of the treatment. 
and three, all return investigational test results will be confirmed. Because the rapid whole genome sequencing is performed under a research protocol, we recognize that returning results prior to CLIA certified confirmation is in conflict with CLIA regulations. Therefore, we created an IRB approved protocol focused on informed consent, enabling clinical test validation to occur in the setting of HIPAA right to access for families to ensure that medically actionable variants could be returned with the potential for clinical intervention. As you can see, the consent is a 14 page document. One thing to note on page six is we have an option to receive incidental medically actionable findings for the patient and each parent. In our analysis, we are not specifically looking for the ACMG 59 genes. However, if we come across them, they will be reported per parent request. Our university clinical team consists of Don Bentley, our research coordinator, who completes daily screening for the NICU and fetal care center, Dr. Carey and Dr. Flores, who aid in patient selection, physical exam, and test interpretation. Rachel Palmquest, genetic counselor, is consenting families. Once enrolled, we create a phenotype using physical examination, laboratory values, and imaging studies. We also include our pediatric subspecialists as indicated, and our consistent members of the team are Drs. Luca Brunelli, Josh Bonkowski, Marty Tristani, myself, and the Medical Genetics Division. The sequencing is performed by research scientists at AREP Laboratories using the Illumina NovaSeq 6000 sequencer. The timing for sequencing is typically between 23 to 24 hours. As pictured here, Eric, Catherine, Devin, and the sequencer have this responsibility on nights, weekends, and sometimes holidays. This is our UC GD bioinformatics analysis team. I will highlight their roles as we discuss the analysis process. Similar to other clinical next generation sequencing tests, the ARUP medical directors are involved in the interpretation and classification. They are assisted by the laboratory genetic and genomic fellows. Chris Miller, our AREP genetic counselor, determines the HPO terms we use for analysis and also helps with test interpretation and clinical correlation. This slide shows our analysis process from raw sequencing data to the final research report. On the fast track column, alignment and variant calling happens within 24 hours. This is an automated process to detect single nucleotide variants, indels, as well as structural variants and de novo mutations, and is using a variety of different tools, which Steve can describe in detail if you would like. Once the variants are detected, concurrent analyses begin to prioritize and interpret the impact of those variants, generating a preliminary result when, within about 24 hours. On average, we know whether there is a strong diagnostic candidate within 48 hours. However, it still takes time to rule out other possible candidates and do a careful literature review. Preliminary findings go to the clinical research teams for their evaluation, and we determine what additional steps should be taken. In parallel, on the slower track, we run a number of analyses to interpret structural variants and other candidates that may not currently meet the diagnostic criteria, but with follow-up may prove to be disease-causing. The results of all of these analyses and discussions are integrated into a final research report. As you can see, it takes a village. This process couldn't happen without our amazing team. So Sean and Carson develop and continue to optimize the automated pipeline and computing strategies. Andrew is doing Rufus calling and interpretation and also wins the prize for the fastest diagnosis in eight and a half hours. Steve and Barry are alternating lead analysts on the UCGD side. Rong and Pinar are alternating lead molecular geneticists who do diagnostic analysis in parallel. Tom, Javier, and Michael are doing most of the structural variant interpretation. All our teams then meet to review the case and determine the result. Not shown here are a host of UCGD developers who built the tools, faculty members making it all possible, and others behind the scenes. We are serving parents to assess decisional conflicts, 
and regret, as well as providers to assess their perceived change in management and satisfaction with testing. We're collecting information on the clinical course and traditional standard of care testing, as well as comorbidity data. We will continue to follow patients throughout their lives to update their phenotypes. We're consenting our families that this data may be reanalyzed in the future and that we are storing raw data and biobanking for future investigation. This chart shows our sequencing and analysis process, shows how our sequencing and analysis process has worked out for each case over time. So cases are across the x-axis and days on the y-axis. Green bars show the sequencing turnaround from the time, I'm sorry, from the time the sample drop until raw data arrives at ECGD. And of course, there's many steps that's embedded in that um, sequencing time. The blue bars show the analysis turnaround time, which is the time from sequence data arriving to UCG to the time we have a preliminary finding. And the gray bars show the time it takes to do the board review, secondary analysis, and literature review to finalize the research report. Our total test time is averaging 11 days. Sequencing time can go as fast as two days, but later cases included a weekend for an average of 3.4 days. Analysis time is getting faster due to automation with an average of two days. Variability in the gray bar depends on whether there's a good candidate and how many other candidates there are. And this is our biggest opportunity to cut down our turnaround time. The red dashed line shows the average time when we have our preliminary results, which is about five days in. Preliminary findings have been confirmed in all of our cases. We have sequenced a total of 11 cases, nine were trios, two were duos. Four of these cases were diagnostic with a soon to be fifth on its way. We did report a variant of unknown significance that is likely diagnostic, but requires additional follow-up. Unfortunately, we have not had a specific treatment for a diagnosed disease yet but I've included some examples of clinical utility. In one patient, our results was identified five days prior to clinical testing and led to withdrawal of care. So the rapid turnaround time can be very meaningful. Other patients have received diagnoses that prompted additional screening and or will inform preventative care throughout the child's development. All of our provider surveys reported clinical utility in their, in their surveys. I included examples on this slide, highlighting improved communication with families and providing clarity for the care team. Under the direction of Carrie Tor, we are surveying parents that participate or decline participation in the study. These questionnaires evaluate attitudes towards consent, precipitation, precipitation in research, and satisfaction with genomic testing. We're also assessing decisional conflict and regret. Parental satisfaction and understanding will help us improve the consent process for future parents and may increase our ability to include more diverse participants in whole genome sequencing. Currently, no participants have reported conflict with their decision or regret after return of results. Our patients deserve further investigation and follow-up. We have listed these genes on Gene Matcher, and we're also working with the functional analysis surface, who you just heard from. We hope new and exciting opportunities continue to come from this project. Having so many wonderful team members also emphasizes the need for excellent communication. We are currently using JIRA to track projects through the sequencing and analysis workflows. It also allows us to track our timing. We have weekly clinical review meetings and twice monthly all team meetings. Currently, we have a defined mailing list for our communication and have been exploring the possibility of using Microsoft Teams. The group will tell you, we seem to only consent patients on Fridays. So to address some of our acute need, we determined a rapid and an ultra rapid sequencing and analysis track. As I mentioned, communication continues to evolve. Logistics is more than half the battle and automation is essential for reducing analysis time. 
We have also learned that validating candidate variants and genes of unknown significance will be a significant task. None of this work would be possible without the support of the Utah Center for Genomic Medicine. We also received support from AREP Laboratories, Illumina, and the Margulies Foundation. Special thanks to all of the members of our team. On today's panel, I am joined by Rachel Comquest, genetic counselor extraordinaire. She has helped navigate ethical and practical considerations in clinical research during project setup, and she currently consents participants into the study and determines clinical relevance of results. Hunter Best directed the development of rapid whole genome sequencing capabilities at ARUP Laboratories in support of the NeoSeq project. He is currently spearheading the rapid whole genome sequencing clinical tests in development at ARUP. Steve Boyden co-directed the development of the UCGD analysis workflow along with Barry Moore. He is the co-lead analyst responsible for case analysis and delivering results to the clinical team. Marianne Karen helps coordinate the bioinformatics, sequencing, and clinical teams during the development and launch of the project. Currently, she is providing project management, infrastructure, and logistical support. Dr. Luca Brunelli is the director of the neonatal genomics program at the University of Utah and has extensive experience in applying next generation sequencing in the neonatal intensive care unit. And I would just like to say he is on a personal quest to sequence every baby in the NICU. Excellent, thank you so much, Sabrina. Let's see, I think our, all of our videos, you can probably stop the screen sharing and then hopefully all of our videos are present on the panel. Add mine as well. So um, we will certainly be opening up the conversation to the audience. We have a good chunk of time for discussion today. Um, and I came locked and loaded with a few starter questions for each of you. Um, I think maybe Rachel, if you are so willing, we'll start with you. Um, I know, you know, this must be a really interesting conversation to have with parents in the NICU um, as you approach them to talk about the study. And then, you know, when you go to discuss results, um, can you talk a little bit about your experience and what maybe has been some of the notable aspects or interactions that you've had with the parents, um, common questions they've asked? Yeah. Um, so overall, I think that kind of the, the initial consent discussion is very, uh, part of it is very similar to what you would do with a clinical genome. So talking about what the test is, what results to expect, as Sabrina said, um, opting in or out of these secondary findings. Um, in addition, there is this piece about uh, biobanking and data banking and use for future resource or research. So right now we have it set up where essentially uh, we will contact families in the future. At that point, they have the option to opt in or opt out. Um, but really kind of that unique aspect um, that took some time to set up with the IRB was the, the idea of using the research results for medical care prior to CLIA certification. So I think that's kind of the, a little bit of the different piece that we focus on during the consent. And it's really kind of discussed in the context of sort of a shared decision-making model. So we discuss sort of, you know, if we find this medically actionable variant, we would discuss our confidence in the variant based on the variant qualities, based on how well it matches up, um, and discuss any benefits and limitations um, to, or benefits and risks to kind of using this data prior to CLIA certification. Um, and really that's kind of what uh, drove the, the IRB process in setting this up, the idea that um, it is possible to find something where there would be a greater uh, risk to waiting for, for a CLIA certification to, to start medical intervention based on this. Um, but I think we also recognize that that's a minority of patients and Sabrina can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we've actually had to um, do that at this point. Um, in terms of questions, I think maybe the most consistent point that comes up uh, of confusion, both for patients and for clinicians and kind of how this differs from the clinical pathway so a lot of these children are also receiving clinical genetic testing um, either in parallel or have received genetic testing prior to um, 
and kind of in the prenatal period typically. Um, so there is kind of a lot of impromptu counseling that comes up about, you know, different testing platforms and different testing strategies uh, that isn't necessarily included in the consent. Um, and I think one of the things that makes the biggest difference is really having a trusted member of the care team be able to introduce this um, study. Um, so both for patient comprehension and for their comfort with the study. Um, so I think a lot of people have probably been victims to our emails trying to <laughs> recruit you to recruit patients. Um, but I do think that sort of clear communication makes a, a big difference for uh, the patients coming into the study. I guess one quick follow-up question. When people decline the study, um, do any of them usually give any specific reasons or um, has there been any consistent themes there? Um, there hasn't been too many declines, but I think the ones that I can recall, there are, there are, I'd say a minority of patients who do have concerns about that idea of future biobanking and data banking and kind of um, data protection. Um, and I think there are some families who are just sort of overwhelmed, understandably overwhelmed and kind of want to focus on uh, the clinical aspect. Um, and we have had families who have sort of said like, I don't want to talk about this now and then reached back out um, about the testing as well. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, the next question is for Hunter. Um, so Sabrina in her presentation mentioned that the sequencing, you know, currently being completed in about a day or so. Um, you know, as the community knows, sequencing historically has taken a lot longer and in the research pipeline still might be on, you know, a month basis. What has AUP done, what has your team done to speed up this process so that the data is turned around in less than a day? Yeah. Um... So I, you know, I think we, first of all, I, I think we, even though it's a lot of work, I think we had the most straightforward job in this entire project, just doing the sequencing and that the, the facets of doing the patient, like dealing with patient care and then consenting seems like a lot more work than what we do in the sequencing. Um, but with that said, you know, it also, uh, we kind of had an easier job cut out for us because Rady Children's Hospital had done an excellent job of laying out a pipeline of how to do whole genome sequencing in a rapid clip. And so even though it took us a long time to build the infrastructure at ARUP to actually do this, um, the process for doing whole genome sequencing on a rapid clip has actually, we haven't deviated very much from what Rady Children's Hospital has done. Um, in that we use the same DNA prep kit that they use from Illumina. We're an Illumina-based sequencing shop using a NovaSeq 6000 sequencer. We're also using an S1 flow cell, the same as Rady described in their project. Um, and I mean, there are small differences. We're using two by 150 base pair um, paired in reading uh, reads compared to two by 100, which Rady did, um, I think largely for a, a time bump um, because it, it takes less time to do two by 100, but there are technical advantages to using two by 150 base pair, um, such as alignment back to the genome more precisely. Uh, it's, I think the, the differences are really marginal. Um, so I, I'd like to give credit where credit is due and say that we really have spoken quite a bit with Rady Children's Hospital about how they work this out and really just modify their pipeline. That's not to say we haven't run experiments to see what works best for our workflow, but um, you know they really did a great job. So we've taken the tack of, if it isn't broke, don't fix it. That's fair, thank you. Um, next question's for Steve. Um, so, you know, Sabrina really went over quite an extensive pipeline of, um, uh, quite an extensive pipeline for analysis. Uh, what is, you know, from your perspective, maybe the one or two, you know, most unique things about how you tackle the data um, in this pipeline that may be different than elsewhere? Because um, I know we have some really unique tools coming out of UCGD. Uh, yeah, so we do uh, use quite a wide variety of different software tools to accomplish the analysis goal overall in a short amount of time. Uh, most of them are uh, developed uh, here within the UCGD labs. We use a few outside tools as well as needed. Um, I uh, will probably refrain from rattling off the full list of tools that we use. Sabrina showed most of them. And if anybody's interested in any of those uh, details uh, about the software that we're using, I'd be happy to discuss that 
afterwards. I will say that overall, the, the choices of the software tools that, that we made were kind of driven by an overall goal to be as comprehensive as possible, as quickly as possible. And that meant um, running a lot of different stuff and with the goal of being comprehensive, we kind of uh, broke it down by variant type. We wanted to make sure that we were covering all three major variant types. We already had well-developed workflows for SNVs and indels and uh, a pretty good head start on our structural variant analysis, which uh, we uh, developed and, and uh, added to a little bit further. And then thirdly, uh, we also wanted to make sure that we took advantage of some uh, development just within the last five to 10 years on the ability to detect short tandem repeat expansions using short read whole genome data. Um, so that would be the, the sort of third category of variants we focused on in addition to the SVs and the single nucleotide indels. And then for each of those three categories with the recognition that every software tool has its strengths and weaknesses, we wanted to make sure that we were covering each of those um, with at least two different tools. And in many cases, we're doing analysis with three or four different tools um, just to make sure that nothing falls through the cracks. Um, and then specifically with the structural variants, you know, uh, every, um, there's five different subtypes of SV and we, and, you know, different tools will detect some, but not all of those different SV subtypes. So again, we wanted to uh, make sure that among all the tools we were running, we had the capability to detect uh, potentially everything. And then taking that one step further, we also wanted to make sure that we had the capability to detect a mixed compound HET where, uh, for example, we had uh, an SNV indel uh, uh, being inherited from one parent and a structural variant affecting the same gene from the other parent. And we do have uh, at least a couple different ways of, of detecting such a mixed compound HET, which uh, uh, we knew intuitively and also from having talked to some of the people at Radies are some of the most challenging cases uh, to diagnose. Um, and we realized, you know, in order to accomplish all these different analyses quickly, that it was going to have to be a team effort. And so we have typically a team of four to five different analysts, each with their own sort of subspecialties, uh, working on the data all simultaneously as soon as it's available. And then um, funneling all of their uh, preliminary uh, reports back to one of the two analyst leads to sort of compile and sift through and come up with, is there a diagnostic candidate here? Um, and in terms of what's different than the, aside just from being as comprehensive as possible and as fast as possible, I think one of the nice things that's come out of this on the analysis side, uh, which was uh, largely driven by uh, Barry Moore, the other co-lead analyst, uh, was the recognition that it would be really nice to standardize these analysis workflows and have them be transferable uh, between different analysts to ensure that, you know, depending on people's availability and so on, that there would always be someone capable of doing any particular type of analysis. And that idea led the, to the development of uh, an analysis SOP, standard operating procedure, where all of the different specialists and the different tools sort of documented in a very formal and very detailed way down to command line level detail uh, and in an online repository exactly how they run their tools and how they analyze them. And so that's really facilitated, I think, the transfer of knowledge between the different UCGD analysts in a way that's um, very helpful for NeoSeq, but uh, speaking for myself personally is also helpful for all of my non-NeoSeq work just to have the benefit of really detailed and really documented procedures to know uh, how other people, and in many cases, the people who wrote the tools themselves are actually running them at the command line level of detail. So I think that's um, been a nice side effect to come out of this. Um, but in terms of doing it quickly, you know, all these tools have really been optimized by the developers. They run uh, typically within a matter of minutes to hours uh, to get you down to that short list of candidate variants. And the time consuming part is really, um, you know, the human interpretation of that very short list, but the actual crunching of the large data set into a, a manageable handful of variants uh, is um, quite readily, readily accomplished uh, computationally. A lot of work, you can tell from this entire team, um, but particularly the UCD team and all of the work they've done to streamline things and document it and work together. Um, that's a great segue from Marianne. Um, you know, I know, 
uh, as you know, director of the Corps um, and you know, a big project program manager for UCGD, you've seen you know all of kind of the difficulties and logistics of how this you know can work and how you know communication can sink or swim things um, moving smoothly. Um, can you comment maybe on one or two of you know maybe the biggest challenges that you've seen um, that maybe hasn't been touched on or maybe elaborate on one that has? Sure. Um, as far as the biggest challenges to sort of making this project run, I mean, as was mentioned previously, we had all of the pieces already in place. We had the clinical lab, we had the UCGD, we had you know the um, the, uh, the the clinical departments and pediatrics all doing pieces of it, but linking it and getting it to run smoothly and really quickly um, was a, a pretty huge task. And I would say that we probably spent um, two months in our weekly meetings discussing just sample IDs and how to track those samples from the clinic where it was gonna be dropped, you know, and the blood was gonna be dropped and what do you write on the tube so that ARUP knows that this is, you know, a NeoSeq project and then ARUP knows, you know, how to give us the data, the UCGD, the data in such a way that our automated pipeline will run, um, you know, automatically knowing who's the mother and the father and the probe and, and um, yeah, I think just, sample tracking and sample IDs um, was sneaky difficult. Like I, that, that, that really surprised me um, just how much time we had to spend working out those kinds of really small, um, seemingly nitpicky details when, you know, stuff that you, you would think would be much harder actually went really quickly. Um, so things like sample details and a, and, a, and a physical specimen moving, you know, across campus um, can really, make or break whether the project works um, and, and so that was a big deal. Um, the, other, uh, the other thing that I think was really difficult but more, more actually fun to watch was to see a lot of people who do research um, have to change their thinking um, to be more clinical and a lot of clinical people who do clinical care having to kind of change their thinking and their perspective to understand um, the research side of things. And so I felt like there was a lot of um, maybe people talking past each other at first, but um, as the project um, progressed and began to run, we all started sort of speaking the same language and I feel like it's a very functional team now. Um, and it's been really fun to watch, you know, that translation in action. So um, I would say those are my comments on just process and setup. Thank you, Marianne. I mean, it is impressive how the team has come together. Um, and, you know, really, it's the project has kind of just started, we have, you know, several more patients that we're going to be able to, you're going to be able to do. Um, and then I know Luca does have a big vision for, you know, what could come next. Um, tying that kind of a little bit to this project, you know, we'd love to ultimately be able to have healthcare insurers, you know, cover this test um, as a clinical test. What information do we need to gather, um, and you know what what type of you know convincing would we need to do to show that insurers to insurers that this is a test that should be covered in the NICU for you know any baby that needs it? Yeah. So, um, so first of all, I think um, some of the great work that has been done here uh, really helps in this sense. I think that insurance want to see a change in medical care and uh, essentially. Uh, an impact on um, uh, clinical uh, outcomes eventually in the future. Um, and so having an approach that um, enables us to track those outcomes, changing care, as Sabrina was mentioning, is really critical. Um, and in that sense, I think it's very important, all the work that is being done across the country and the world for that matter, uh, in this sense, um, uh, I think you will take multiple studies, large studies to convince insurance insurances to cover. We know that they've already started doing it um, based on the great work that um, uh, early work that Rady has done. Uh, so in California, some insurances are already covering for this. We hope this will uh, change uh, and move things here in Utah as well. Uh, we know that some of the, uh, the early program we had uh, where we had a large team panel from ARUP is already covered by a number of insurances. Uh, so I think there's reason to be hopeful. 
the other dimension, I guess, that I would uh, bring up is the, um, uh, as everybody's acutely aware, looking at how many people uh, Sabrina showed that are involved in this project, um, you know, how complex and um, really the question of increasing capacity and uh, making this program scale scalable to larger number of patients is a, is a key issue, especially if we want to think that um, there's many NICUs around the country that are not as lucky as we are to have such a nice uh, genomics and um, genetics and infrastructure um, as we have here at the University of Utah or as it might be available in other, in other sites. And so I think for us as clinicians, it's, it's important to, to be aware uh, that um, also, as Lorenzo was mentioning, you know, we live in a system where not every um, person, unfortunately, is covered with uh, healthcare, and and we want to be cognizant of finding ways to simplify these processes and, and find ways to ask ourselves how how do we make this less expensive and and we open it up for for more babies to, to have access to, to these kinds of uh, benefits of precision medicine going forward. Thank you, Luca. So I guess now we can switch over to questions from the audience. Uh, we have two in the chat and I certainly welcome more. So if you have a question, please enter it there. Um, so the first question is from Erin. Uh, have any of the patients who are inconclusive after sequencing developed any new phenotypes? Um, you know, they're no longer in the neonatal period um, that brought forth new candidate genes or variants or otherwise revised the interpretation of the genome. Uh, not yet that I yes. can. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say not yet. You know, we I have the vision that we're going to do kind of a re-review of all of the cases on a yearly basis. We just haven't hit that year mark yet. Um, we definitely have several cases, though, that are requiring us to um, do some additional family member testing um, and a case that we're actually going to take back to the functional analysis team. And so I think there's still more to come out of these. Um, we are limited by this is a very acutely ill population. And so some of our negative cases, unfortunately, have um, not survived. And so it kind of ends a little bit of um, our odyssey for them. But um, I think there's still exciting new things to come that we're going to have time on our side as these neonates continue to get older and develop new kind of signs and symptoms. Yeah, I would just add, so, so our first case came in last February, so it hasn't been quite one year yet. We did discuss before the project launched what the periodic reanalysis schedule would be like and different ideas were floated six months or a year um, being, you know, two of the options. Uh, we haven't really finalized or formalized that reanalysis schedule. I think only the first two of the 11 cases that we've analyzed so far were within um, that first six months, but those were both negative cases. Uh, like Sabrina said, I'm not aware of any new phenotypes that have developed in those first two that have been more than six months uh, that would significantly change uh, the analysis from, from the clinical phenotype side, although uh, they are still, you know, they're less than one year old, so they are still infants, if not newborns, and so they're still too young to have, you know, for example, development of um, developmental delay or cognitive impairment or some of the neurological or neurodevelop or neuromuscular types of uh, features that might sometimes develop in childhood diseases at older ages. So I think uh, that's still largely an open question, um, but. Uh, I think being that we're close to the one year mark, it is a good time to revisit the issue of um, putting in place a more formal structure for making sure that the negative cases get reanalyzed uh, on, in a consistent way. Great. The next question is from Sarah Knight. Um, as genome sequencing is introduced in the NICU, what are the major transition points and we've kind of touched a little bit on challenges um, and advantages of coordinating care with genome sequencing. Uh, 
Sabrina, I'm sure you want to take this. <laughs> well, I just want to say there are not enough medical geneticists in the world. I can say that um, quite confidently. Um, I think that neonatologists are thrilled with this technology. I think we still have a lot to learn of how to integrate it into our care, um, especially some of my more senior colleagues, um, just because, you know, they haven't, um, they weren't teaching next generation sequencing as they were going through training. And I, so I think there's a little bit of a steep learning curve, but I haven't heard any negative comments from um, the group as a whole. Everyone's excited about it. They get as excited for negative results as positive results because we really look to that as more information that helps us really be able to personalize the care for our patients. Does anyone else want to jump in on that, like the hunter? Yeah, um, so I just wanted to comment as this transition to an actual clinical test from the research environment, I think some of the challenges there are actually, because as you guys have seen from our acknowledgement slides, there's like 100 people working on this project. So when this goes live clinically, obviously it can't be this level of involvement in that the sample would come in, it would be run through the lab, and then a single medical director would need to be able to analyze this and report this out um, in a very timely fashion because we plan on this going live just like we're running it now in a rapid so that it's being turned around in a week, basically. Um, and I think the challenges there are what programs are absolutely critical for us to run this clinically. And that's what we're trying to dial in now. Um, we're, we're continuing to learn on this process in every way, you know, whether it's the samples need to come in the yellow stat bag, which we just found out about like two weeks ago because we had a sample get lost in the system because it was in the green stat bag. So I, I think there are a lot of logistics that we just didn't even foresee um, when this project started that um, we're still continuing to learn. And I think, so I, I think there's a whole lot of opportunities to improve the process, but um, right now I think it's getting pretty good. And I think we're gonna continue to improve upon it over the next you know, nine months before we go live with an actual clinical test. But the monumental aspect of how, how many people are involved in this, I think just underscores what a complex project this is. And then dialing that down into a one person analysis protocol, um, you can see that it's, it's very technically challenging um, for the medical directors involved in signing these cases and then the clinicians reviewing that data when it comes back to them. I, I guess, oh. Go ahead, Luca. I, I was just gonna mention, yeah, uh, continuing what Sabrina mentioned, uh, you know, in the NICU, some of the challenges, uh, you know, neonatology has been typically a, a, a specialty, a physiology-based specialty. So, so in the past, uh, yes, we have not typically been involved with these kinds of technologies, but as time goes by, we learn every day that um, our NICUs are going to be steeped more and more in these kinds of things uh, from genome sequencing of human, you know, from sequencing of human genomes to sequencing of um, uh, in met metagenomics project as well, where we would be sequencing um, uh, pathogens in trying to identify infections in babies, for example, that, for example, currently so hard for us to uh, to find. And so there, I, I think this project project really opens um, a world of opportunity in the NICU. And as Sabrina mentioned, yes, there's there's a lot of education that needs to, to happen both in our uh, trainees, but uh, certainly in our um, uh, in our midst, uh, because as Hunter uh, mentioned, when things like these goes, go alive, one would hope that some of us in the NICU would be able, for example, to obtain consents in some cases, you know, when the weekend hits or uh, holidays and things like that. And so that, of course, requires a lot of um, education and, and learning. So I kind of wanted to add to um, Hunter's comments a little bit in that um, part of what we wanted to do in setting this up with the research analyses being so broad was to kind of arrive at a conclusion um, at what is the essential process 
for a clinical test, um, you know, kind of winnow that down into like the, the quickest, most reliable, easiest way to get to the answer. Um, but that from our perspective on the UCGD research side, we would love to be able to continue um, a research program. So once the clinical test is live, you know, we're sending um, most of the projects to the clinical side, but we would hope there could be another track for, to continue with the research for those cases where you really do have to dig in and you have to look um, in, in more depth and, and maybe spread out across a few different types of tools to um, solve these more difficult cases. So that's what we would envision in the future is send most of them through the, the ultra rapid pipeline and then have a research kind of backup pipeline going um, that could handle um, that, that could spread out across a lot of different people and a lot of different tools and, and dig a little deeper. Yeah, and just just one more comment on that. I, I think that's, uh, you know, the, the previous um, talk being about the Penelope project and about um, the fact that people don't always have access to this test, even though they need it. I think having the research protocol available, especially given that it's not clear that insurance is going to reimburse this, um, does allow for more people to get access to this testing, which is also really important because as we've seen in this project, it really does impact the care of these kids. Absolutely. Well, thank you all. We are right at time. Um, so I really appreciate your participation in this discussion and for our audience uh, for asking questions and hopefully um, enjoying the discussion. Um, I'm going to stay on for a few minutes. We are switching back over to the Hopin platform for um, our second poster session. We will be back here um, on Zoom for our final closing keynote from Joe Gleason uh, at 4.45. Um, so keep that in mind, but we will have an hour to go explore the posters, um, et cetera. I am happy. Um, I know there were some technical difficulties for people trying to share their AV on Hopin. I'm happy to go over that again if anyone wants to stay on and um, ask questions. If not, I'd like to direct you over to Hopin. So thank you again to our panelists uh, from both sessions and um, see you in the other platform.